or assorted. Right? I mean, I, I didn't say like a sample of pure silicon dioxide sand. Right? I'm saying our soil's got all sorts of different things, different states, rocks, sand, all that kind of stuff. That's very heterozygous. As opposed to homogeneous mixtures, which would be um, in very even distribution of substances um, known as solutions. Example, saline, my person albumin. So when we when we take table salt and we put it in water, at that very moment we mix them, we have a mixture. We just said the word mix, right? We have a mixture and it is heterozygous. Assuming we don't put too much table salt in that water, eventually we will have a homogeneous mixture. We still have a mixture, but it's homogeneous. Okay? And you know, so the big difference is that even distribution of substances versus not. So why don't they call it heterogeneous instead of heterozygous? I don't know now you're here. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they do even. I don't know. Maybe there's more than one name for it. Maybe genius has something to do with like life or you know it has to do. I don't know. That's scary. See, all those questions are really good questions if I think of them. You know, all those theoretical questions, if I think of them, that's a good question. If not, then I have to decide whether that's a good question. Actually, it's a good question, but I like those kind of questions. But anyway, I'm just giving you a hard time. All right, but this is what I really want you to get here. When we think of solutions, we mostly think of a solid and a liquid. That's what we mostly always have thought about when it comes to solutions. I just gave you all sorts of examples of solids and liquids. Table salt. Um, I, you know, in the previous lecture, I was talking about all these, you know, molarity and all that. It was every example was a solid and a liquid. However, all of these are examples of solutions. A gas and a gas. So you could call the air we breathe a solution. That one gas is dissolved in another. It's not the same principle because there's not like this movement of the molecules and that allows that molecule, like that solid, to get into the liquid. But um, it is truly a solution. Another really good example of a practical use of the term solution is a gas in a liquid. So the plasma that is flowing through our bodies. Um, the plasma that's thrown through our bodies, not only are there solids dissolved in that plasma, there's also gases dissolved in that plasma. That makes it a solution as well. Liquids and liquids. So all these are examples. Um, when it comes to a solid and a liquid, what we think of a lot is drugs. So STB, STP actually stands for sodium thiopental, which is no longer even made, but yeah. locals like local anesthetics. Those are just some examples, but there's a ton of examples of that. So a solute is the dissolved substance. Solvent is, is that which the solute dissolves into. I think what I'm going to do next year is I'm not going to have two, two like two separate lectures. I'll make it all one. Because like this would have been relevant for some of the stuff we were talking about. We'll just kind of do it more spongy. Anyway, sorry. Um, so, see here you go. Molarity, molality. I told you it's coming. Um, the difference is mole solute, mole solute, but kilogram solvent versus liter of solution. Once again, when you're talking about water, it's the same. So the only thing that's different is not this part, but this part. And so that slight difference I was talking about is because when you add solute to a, a water, for example, it, it will actually slightly change in volume and in mass. And so there can be a difference between molarity and molality. But when we're talking about like serum, those it's so dilute that it's virtually the same. So very interchangeable other than by definition. Do you know the difference in definition? Otherwise, it's pretty much interchangeable. Okay? A, mi a millimole is one one thousandth of a mole. Okay? Just keep that remembered. Okay, equivalence. What do we think of when we talk about equivalence? 
you know, yeah, in, in our experience, what do we give? Like an equivalence or mill equivalence? Potassium. Oh, oh potassium. Yeah, when do, you, when do you ever say, I'm going to go give 20 grams of potassium chloride? You never think of it that way, do you? We you think I'm going to give mill equivalents? Did you ever wonder what a mill equivalent was? And why, why, why do we do that one separately? You know, it's funny, when, when I was a nurse in the ICU, a lot of those times I didn't ever ask the question. I why do sometimes we look at the drugs in percent? Then how come other times it's in like concentration? And other times it's in mill equivalents? Oh, I never thought about those things. Or just in mass. I never thought about those things. And then you get into this and you go, oh, there's some relevance to some of that. So, but anyways, equivalent weight is a gram weight of a substance which will combine to replace one atom or one mole of hydrogen and equivalent. What in the world are you talking about? Here's the easy thing. An equivalent is like a gram weight of charges. Think of it as charges. So just like we're talking about osmoles earlier, now we're talking about charges. So when we talk about 58.5 grams of sodium chloride, Na plus plus Cl minus, all right? We have one mole of Na plus. We have one mole of Cl minus. We have one mole of positive charges, and we have one mole of negative charges. You can get it. It's okay. Um, so we have a whole bunch of charges there. An equivalent is all about the charges. And a mill equivalent is one one thousandth of an equivalent. We don't really ever give any drug or any crystalloid or anything in terms of equivalence. It's always mill equivalents. Ionic solutions are solutions of uh, atoms or molecules in the ionized form, like paper salt. So it's that white crystallized substance in the solid form. How strong are those bonds? In a solid form, they're fairly strong, but not by, but not by like attraction, but more because they can't go anywhere, right? So, so you will find sources that call them strong bonds, but it's important to understand why we call them strong bonds. So once they're in a solution, dissolved in let's say water, it's a very weak bond, right? Relatively speaking, not to in comparison to like a hydrogen bond, but in comparison to a covalent, absolutely, right? But anyways. So, and then once it's dissolved, it's Na plus plus Cl minus. So, um, and then it becomes fully ionized. So, ionized drugs are lipid soluble, are not lipid soluble. Unionized drugs are lipid soluble. They do cross the lipid membranes. We're going to delve a little bit, just a touch, just a touch into the concept of pH and pKa. Um, but when we get to the acid base lecture, it's on. All right. So, um, but what I do want you to get for now is just that when we have a drug, if that drug exhibits itself in an ionized and an unionized form, the only form that can get in the cell is the unionized form. Perfect example is local anesthetics. And our, when we have local anesthetics, there is a balance between the charged form of local anesthetic, which is ionized, and the uncharged. The charged form has no chance of getting in that cell. The uncharged form does. And so there is that balance that occurs, and it becomes very pertinent and practical. pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration as that represented here, and um, we'll get to that later. I'm just going to see this. Because really, we get to it. We get to it later. Colloids. Colloids are precariously balanced mixtures. So when we talked about different solutions, there's Example that I have here. Now we have colloids. When we think of colloids, what, what do we mostly think of? No. Albumin. That's like the first one that most people think of. Lipids. 
Another good example. There's suspensions where we're not talking about necessarily like an ionized solid being dissolved in a liquid, but it's more like some kind of balance. And I can't, it's something I don't even totally get, but it's like this balance where they're not separated. They're, they're in some kind of homogenous state. When you look at a bottle of albumin, you don't see like the proteins on the top and the water on the bottom. Even though 5% of it is albumin, the rest of it is water, or some actually, um, there's some solutes in there too, or whatever, but it's all like, it's like in a suspension there. That albumin is evenly mixed, but not in the way that so table salt is, okay? Um, so that's what an, a colloid is. Um, they're large molecules balanced between precipitation by gravity, meaning coming out of that solution, and the suspension by intramuscular force, it just kind of holds it there. Um, and, uh, it's just important to know that when you add things to the colloid, you could potentially alter those intermolecular forces in what's called crack the solution. So um, it used to be well, uh, often done where we would mix lidocaine in propofol before we administer the propofol. It had great advantages because um, propofol is very painful. If you give someone propofol, especially in a little vein, uh, in a large bolus of propofol, they'll scream. Sometimes, it depends on, it depends. But they'll at least go, that hurts, that really hurts. Um, and the reason why is because propofol is big, those big molecules will just pulls water right out of the cells practically into the into the suspension there. And if you mix lidocaine in there, it actually has a numbing effect immediately. It's crazy, I mean, you, get, you put that lidocaine in the propofol and I mean, there's been tests done that they've proven it's less painful. You can also give lidocaine before the propofol, and you get the same effect or better. Well, everybody would go with easy. So this is what everybody would do. They would draw five cc's of lidocaine in a big syringe, and then just before they draw, you know, give it to the patient, they draw propofol into it and administer it. Um, nice and easy. No, you don't need two syringes and that kind of thing. But there's problems where if it sits there for very long, it actually ruins the solution. You'll crack. You'll actually see crystals in it and that kind of thing. That's what this is all about. This is the bullet here. It was one of Dr. Weller's big, like, uh, pet peeves. So you can't mix lidocaine with propofol? You can't. Okay. You can't. You can't. It's just that's what can happen if you do. If you mix it and you give it shortly after, it's not a problem. If you try to give it four hours later, it could be a problem. Some, he would tell you it's a problem like that. Ah, but. It is, it is a problem. It is potentially a problem. Solubility. Measure how much solute you can dissolve in a given amount of solvent. So, this is where I start having some fun. I love this stuff. I think we both, we all, just from our experience of life, recognize that when you have a solid that you're trying to dissolve in a liquid, it just seems to dissolve better when the liquid's warm, right? I mean, if any of y'all are into, and I used to be, I just can't handle it now anymore, but if any of y'all are into good southern sweet tea, I mean, you know that you got to put that sugar in when the tea's hot, because if you try to mix it in when it's ice, you'll have a very heterogeneous mixture, or heterozygous, heterogeneous. <laughs> no. That's your home. So, um, but because, I mean, I don't know, some of y'all from the North, you may not know, but I mean, I used to serve a banquet I used, in, in Gainesville. I served this one banquet where everybody had lots of sweet tea and we'd have to drink. I mean, we'd take, it would be sugar packets, just pop it out of our pockets because, mm -hmm. can I have some more sugar? Yes, you can have some more sugar. There you go. And we, well, at the end of the, end of the night, we're cleaning up. I mean, every glass had five tablespoons of sugar still sitting in the bottom of the glass. It was crazy. But if you mix the sugar in ahead of time when it's, the tea's hot, you can put lots of sugar in there. Table salt, by the way, it's almost no difference in solubility between like room temperature and boiling. Almost no difference. Um, so not all solutes are the, that way, but in general, if you increase the temperature of the liquid, the solvent, you will have some degree of increase of solubility of the solid. However, if you put 
if you increase the temperature of a liquid, the solubility of the gas in the liquid actually decreases. It's opposite. So cold water can dissolve more oxygen than warm water. Facts. So it's harder to give an inhaled anesthetic to someone who's hypothermic? Uh, it's, you can look at it that way, or probably hypothermic. the best application to that is it's harder to get it out of them. If they're cold and it's now in their plasma, all dissolved in that plasma, it's harder to remove because as it's coming by the alveoli, it wants to stay more. It's fine. Right. And some of you are like, oh, wait, he's talking about taking distribution. I've been trying for three weeks to figure that out. can't wait till next week when Dr. Weller records the light off for me. If, if somebody's <laughs> light doesn't turn on next week, you're going to be so disappointed because I talked this lecture up so much. <laughs> Don't quit. <laughs> but I mean, uh, here's, here's what I go on this side for just a minute, just a minute. Because I can feel y'all's pain of these hurricanes, all right? I, I, I know all about it. 2004, I'm in Miami doing my first semester of anesthesia school. Well, the first semester for me was like your semester right now. I didn't do the first two like you guys did. Doing chemistry and physics, arm of anesthesia one, yada, yada, yada. Hurricane Francis, hurricane this, hurricane that. I mean, we, it was like every, and it, they always fell on the, the days of the week that we had classes. I mean, we, we would sit there twice. There was three days we sat in somebody's apartment when we should have been in class trying to study. And so one, one, of, the, one of the hurricanes, it wasn't Francis, it was the one that came after it. Because um, Francis parked itself right outside of like Miami, and just didn't go anywhere. Finally, it hit Miami, like, but it sat there for like two days and didn't hit us, but everybody was evacuated. And then it finally came on. And then um, one of the ones that came after that is Charlie. Charlie. Well, Charlie went across yeah. from Tampa up um, earlier. But we were down in Miami, so it didn't affect us as much. But then um, there was one after that where we all piled in this classmate's um, apartment, and we were already supposed to be getting the uptake and distribution lecture. But we were like, well, we're here. We might as well just try to learn this ourselves so that we're ahead of it. Racking our brains. I mean, for a whole day, we off and on went back to the concepts. Like, OK. I don't understand how cardiac output, like increased cardiac output actually delays um, induction and what's all this stuff? And, and it was, uh, and um, it, it, it was, we're spinning our wheels. We're, we should have been studying, I don't know, like cars or something. I don't know, because we would have been, would have been more efficient use of our time. <clears throat> and we got to that lecture. <laughs> <laughs> it also we didn't have a DVD yet, so you know, I, you know, the DVD money hold up too. We could have watched the inner DVD at that point. But anyways, yeah. So I'm talking it up big time, but yeah. Oh, that was the aside. Bottom line, is, yes, I know what it's like to go through lots of hurricanes in that very stressful semester that you're in right now. It affected us a bunch. Um, hopefully, we're done with it. Um, so, liquid, gas in a liquid. Um, so normally, and I just didn't get prepared enough this time, normally I walk into this lecture today, and the very first thing I would do is pick a volunteer, and I'd have a can of soda that's like outside temperature hot, and a can of soda that is ice cold. We open them, I have the student take a sip of each. Tell me what you can tell. They always say, well, one's hot, one's cold. How about the fizz? About the same. An hour later, I ask them to take another sip. And they say, well, I can start to notice a difference. By the end of the lecture, the warm soda is flat. The cold soda still has fizz. I wonder why. Well, let's talk about that a minute. So I was in Seattle, and I couldn't believe it. I saw it on a menu. And I, I just thought this was like, you had to go east of Seattle to encounter this word for soda. 
right? So like, I mean, it was on a menu in Seattle. I'm like, I thought that was like a Wisconsin thing, or like a, maybe even a little further east than that too, like Midwest, you know, pop, pop. But anyway, so whatever, what's what's our pop today? Sprite? I don't know, whatever. So you've got your bottle or your can of a pop, and inside this pop is sugar or sweetener or whatever, but one of the things that's in it is a whole bunch of this carbonic acid that's in equilibrium with what? H2O plus CO2 and HCO3 minus plus H plus. Yes, totally in there, just like in our plasma. Same dang stuff. So anybody says so is bad for you? Well, it's in your plasma already. <laughs> so there, it's for perfectly fine for you, right? Well, not really. But anyways, um, so this is going on here, and as long as you don't open the can, if anybody ever watched Lost, you know it can last forever, right? You know, so <laughs> few of you got that one. But anyways, so it can it can have the fizz forever. But once you open that can, something happens. Bubbles. Suddenly, you open the can, you pop the can, and you allowed CO2 to be produced because there was pressure on top. Oh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because I really should be talking about Henry first before I do this. Let's get back to this in there because I want you to get the full effect. So. It's really cool how you change that. Every time I come over, I'm thinking, oh, I've got to. No, it's you. You're just <laughs> See, last year we did it all in the other room. We didn't have these TV screens here. I'm seeing how it works. All right. So Henry's law. Henry's law states that the solubility of a gas, which is the amount of gas that dissolves in liquid, liquid is directly proportional. You know what that means now to the partial pressure of the gas in the gas phase. Whoa. whoa directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas in the gas phase and inverse to temperature. Now, technically, this last part is not really Henry's law, but it's applicable. It's kind of like the Graham's law added to pick this last part. But the Henry's law says the solubility of a gas in the liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas in the gas phase above the liquid. So Henry's law says, basically, that if you have a gas over a liquid, the more gas you have, the more gas you're going to get in the liquid. It sounds a lot like Fick. I mean, Fick says if all of a sudden you increase the concentration of a permeable thing like gas, you're going to cause more diffusion and you're going to get more down here, right? That's Fick. Henry is specific circumstance. Only this circumstance, gas over a liquid, solubility of the gas in the liquid. That's the only way Henry applies. It doesn't have anything to do with solute in a liquid, solute in a gas, anything like that. It's just gas in a liquid. That's Henry's law. Okay? So an example, a scuba diver at depth is breathing pressurized air, will dissolve if, uh, a greater amount of nitrogen. Um, upon returning to the normal atmospheric pressure, that nitrogen will have a lower solubility because there's less uh, pressure and it'll, and it'll come out and they get the bends, okay? Um, that's one example. Another example, carbonated drinks, which I'll show you in a minute. Another example, inhaled anesthetics. So back to our soda, our pop. Stop. It's Coke, right? We call it Coke no matter what it is. No, I'm not, I don't believe in that either. But anyway, all right, so what happens is, so this CO2 is allowed to exit. Because what was going on before we popped it was this air that was up here was primarily CO2. That little bit of air that's in your bottle of soda before you open it is primarily CO2. We let it go. We let it get out. So the concentration of CO2 here decreased. When that happened, there's CO2, now the CO2 is in that equilibrium, but there is some CO2 in this liquid. When that happened, Henry's law says that it's the opposite of what we have written here. 
but we would basically say it's directly proportional. So if the concentration of CO2 here decreases, the concentration of here decreases as well because it comes out. So CO2 starts coming out right away. We saw that's all CO2. So as the CO2 starts coming out, we end up altering this equilibrium that occurs here. And something says that when you disrupt that equilibrium state on one side, there is a shift of that reaction to create a new equilibrium. What is that? Le Chatelier. Le Chatelier. Thank you so much. And I talk about Le Chatelier. I told you Le Chatelier is going to come back. Because Le Chatelier's principle says that because you did that, you're going to cause a shift of this reaction to where it's going to start moving in this direction. Okay? And as it moves in this direction, you start getting more and more water, the flat taste, and CO2 produced. The CO2 leaves, more, more, more. You're getting rid of all that acid. You're getting, next thing you know, you're left with just water and flavoring and color and carcinogens. No, just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, um, just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, um, so that's Le Chatelier's principle. So how does that how does that compare to what happens in our lungs when it comes to carbon dioxide? In our plasma. So this is not really Henry's law exactly, although it can be applicable, but it certainly is a diffusion applicability where, and back to that RBC picture that you saw earlier. So we have our alveoli and we have our capillary. And we have this reaction occurring Notice I put them on the opposite side this time. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter which side you put them on, right? You have this reaction occurring, and there's no CO2 here. The water can't pass. The carbonic acid can't pass. These certainly can't pass into the alveoli. CO2 leaves. Oh! Le Chatelier says, well, let's go this way. Get more CO2. And every time this goes by, put CO2 in the alveoli, we breathe it out. In the end, though, and this is a little step ahead, in the end, though, what does that do to the concentration of that guy right there? Increase or decrease it? Decrease it. That's how we breathe out our acid. I have a question. Yes. So are you saying, like, say for the pop example, right? Are you saying um, before it was open, the CO2 was exerting a higher partial pressure, and then when you open it, it's less partial pressure? Yeah. So what's the what do you think the concentration of CO2 is in this in this air pocket right here right now? Uh, High low. Since it's been open, probably low. Oh no, because it's been producing some of that CO2. And it's been released back into here, but it's now trapped, right? Higher. Higher. It's now trapped. So now I open the, the top. That rush was mostly CO2, and now it's allowed to mix with air, right? So now we have less CO2 there right now, right? So the concentration, the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in that air right there decreased. Well, Henry's law says, well, if it decreased there, it's going to decrease here. How does it decrease there? It comes out. Right? But believe it or not, whatever CO2 is in that liquid right there is dissolved CO2. It's dissolved in that liquid. And if it's hard for you to believe that gas can be dissolved in a liquid, well, how do fish breathe? Seriously, where do they get their oxygen? Bubbles? No, there's oxygen in that liquid. And their gills are able to extract the oxygen out. How do our cells get oxygen? Seriously, how do your cells get oxygen? Dissolved O2 and hemoglobin, bound to hemoglobin. I heard two different answers. One of them is correct. How did your cell get oxygen? Okay, got two answers. One is 
I'm going to extrapolate on this on the question a little bit or the answer. One is dissolved oxygen in the plasma diffuses into the cell, and now your cell has oxygen. The other one is dissolved oxygen. I mean, sorry, bound oxygen to the hemoglobin goes over to the cell. First one or second? Dissolved oxygen, folks. Bound oxygen and hemoglobin, folks. That's where most of it is. And, and then those who I say are wrong will say, well, you didn't quite work in a fair way. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably true. Yeah. Oxygen does not leap off of hemoglobin and just jump right over to the cell. And that's where you tell well, you didn't work it like that. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I did, right? Okay. But it is very important to understand that dissolved oxygen in the hemoglobin. I mean, sorry, bound oxygen to hemoglobin has to come out of the hemoglobin and into the plasma first. Does it do it in acidotic conditions? That can affect things, yeah. right? That's all your oxygen hemoglobin dissociation correct, right? But it has to get into the plasma first in a dissolved state. Your PaO2 on a blood gas is a measure of the partial pressure of oxygen in the plasma. Right. They don't get that from the RBC. And I don't know if you noticed today, I keep saying plasma. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing on the word plasma. What is plasma? It's everything but the RBCs, right? Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of liquid, a whole bunch of water, and a whole bunch of stuff dissolved in it. Okay? There's, there's other stuff too, proteins and all that stuff. But it has to get in the plasma. It's dissolved in the plasma. And then the concentration of the O2 in that plasma then is in a gradient with the cell. A cell. Cell, right? Here, how about that? The cell. And there's less O2 there because it's got it used it all in your whole process of producing ATP, right? And so now because there's less, there's a concentration gradient. So really the way oxygen gets into your cell is the dissolved oxygen in the plasma. Now, what gets confusing is I didn't ask you where is most of the oxygen in your blood. Because by far, by far, the most of the oxygen is mostly found in hemoglobin. Like 17 times more oxygen, or even more than that, about that. 17 times more oxygen in the hemoglobin than dissolved in the oxygen uh, in the plasma to start with. Right? There's tons in the hemoglobin. The carrying capacity of oxygen in your blood is almost entirely the hemoglobin, but it doesn't go straight from the hemoglobin to the cell. It dissolves into the oxygen into your plasma and then crosses. And whose law says it goes from that liquid to another? Pick. Henry's law only applies to a gas over a liquid. So Henry's law is more applicable in alveol alveolar to capillary. Right? So whose law explains that if you increase FiO2 in the alveoli, you'll get an increase in PaO2 in the Capillary. And fix. <laughs> right? Henry's law does apply there, but fixed law does as well. So Henry's is a very special situation that doesn't necessarily kick fix off, right? <coughs> All right. Fix the grandfather. Right? So there's your Henry's law. Partial pressure of difference in a, of a substance in the gas phase is equal to Henry's law of constant, who cares, times. It's the mole fraction of I in a liquid phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what I said earlier. Okay. Solubility coefficients. Mole fractions do not lend themselves easily to medical applications. So, like, for example, the SI unit is the Bunsen coefficient. SI, the, the international units and all. And it's volume of a gas corrected to standard temperature and pressure, which dissolves a unit of volume of liquid. You do need to memorize that, but who cares? Because we don't ever use Bunsen coefficients. An easier anesthesia applicable description of solubility is the Oswald coefficient. Now, when we say the word coefficient, what do we mean? What's another word for coefficient? It's not quite the same, but it's it's what we think of. A ratio. ratio. Yeah. I heard one, one or two people. We're talking about a ratio, like a proportion, right? Something to another. 
It's all about equilibrium. All right. So an Oswald coefficient is the volume of a gas. See, we're talking about like proportions or ratios. Volume of gas dissolves in a unit of volume of liquid at a temperature conserved. At a temperature conserved. So it's not corrected to STP because, frankly, if our bodies were at STP, we'd be dead. <laughs> standard temperature and pressure. Well, pressure is fine. What's standard temperature? Mm. Definitely not zero Kelvin. That would be like, there's nothing standard about that, right? So what's standard temperature? I think it's 20 centigrade. That's what they list all the uh, SVPs at. Sounds good to me. How many people, how many people uh, exist at 20 degrees centigrade? If their body temperature is 20 degrees centigrade, they're dead. Anyway, so let's keep it real simple. Let's just use a partition coefficient. It's the ratio of the amount of substance present in equal volumes of two phases at the state of equilibrium temperature. So we're going to not really put it in a box at all. We're going to say whatever we're looking at, we're just going to call it a partition coefficient, give it no special name, and just say it's a ratio. Where am I going with this? Blood gas coefficients. Oil gas coefficients. Um, fat blood coefficients, yeah. muscle blood coefficients. Yeah. These are ratios that are anesthetics, are inhaled anesthetics that you're going to get all into in the next couple of weeks. Um, the ratios of how they exist in one state versus another. Okay. Um, so if one of the phases of gas, if one of the phases is gaseous, the partition coefficient and the Oswald coefficient are the same. But partition coefficients don't necessarily have to be just gas to um, liquid or whatever. They can be liquid to tissue. They're not specific because we don't deal in specific. So real quick, if your blood gas coefficient, everybody, how many people, well, you don't have to show your hands, but I mean, because you really haven't had to learn this yet, but it would be helpful for you to go ahead and start looking at this stuff if you haven't read about it. Things like blood gas coefficient. What does that mean? What is that talking about? Because if your blood gas coefficient is one, one is equal to one over one, right? That's basic algebra. One is equal to one over one. And we're talking about a ratio. That means that that gas is just as, like when you, once you reach equilibrium, you have just as much concentration of that gas in one phase versus another. So blood gas meaning it's just as concentrated in the blood as it is in the gaseous phase. Or what we like to say is it likes the blood as much as it likes the gas. So when we talk about blood gas coefficient for an inhaled anesthetic, we're talking about the concentration of the gas in the alveoli versus the plasma. That's what we're really talking about. So, and the way ratios work is the first name that's mentioned is the numerator. The second name mentioned is the denominator, so blood gas. So if a blood gas coefficient is one, that's one over one. What if the blood gas coefficient is two? Twice as affinitive to the blood as it is the alveoli. The better word, I, I, mean, I wish they do this. Instead of saying blood gas, they say plasma gas. But it's really we're talking about plasma, but that's fine. Um, so a blood gas coefficient of two will be much much, much more like the blood than the alveoli. That creates a real problem for getting it out. A real problem for getting it out of the body. It also makes it a real problem for getting it to the brain. That's all for Dr. Bellover to talk about. All right? But these, this is where this all comes into play. All right, now if, a, if another drug has a blood gas coefficient of 0.42, anybody know what that drug is? Ziva? Yes. Wait, yes. no. Uh oh, oh, uh, yeah, yes. Well, because I thought Des was 0.46, but like, I mean, there's variation yes. between this. What's 0.42? Yes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm like, afraid I'm going to tell you wrong. Yeah, that's right. Yes. What's nitrous? Yeah. Right? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, right. I was like, starting to question myself there. Oh, What's SIBO? Right. Anybody know? 0.69.7 isoflurane. Isoflurane is a fun one. Isoflurane, isoforane, 1.4. Nice. 
Nice little fun one there. All right, 1.4. Halothane, long gone drug pretty much, but anybody know? 2.54, I think. 2.4, 2.5. Which one likes the blood the most of the ones I named? Halothane, by far. Which one hates the blood? Dez and nitrous. They, they hate the blood. And yet, for some reason, they're the fastest onset. Whew. If he hates the blood, how does he get the patient? If he doesn't want to get the blood, how does, how does it get the patient to sleep fast? I don't understand. He wants to leave the blood into the brain. Mm. That was a piece that took me forever to get until the aha lecture. Okay, so anyways, um, we're running out of time because I really want to get to the last thing. And that is, even though this isn't really directly related to lecture, I will ask you test questions on this, by the way, on exam one. Um, I think it's very important that you learn a few things about calculations. I think I might have given this to you on day one, the whole 1% thing. Did I give it to you already? Oh, I'm about to give you a gem. This is a gem. Don't you ever forget this. Mildly annoyed. But maybe that's why students are so scared to work with me, because I say stuff like that in lecture. I don't, I'm actually really used to work with in clinical. But um, just ask a senior. Don't ask like somebody that's just a little ahead of you, because they'll say, yeah, he's scary. But, but once they've been with me a while, they realize, actually, they were just afraid for no reason. But anyways, this is a gem. When you have a drug given to you in percent, and you want to know milligrams per ml, multiply the percent by 10. Mm -hmm. Can you say that again? When you have a drug given to you in percents, and you want to know milligrams per ml, because that's really what we care about, right? Multiply by 10, that's your answer. So that question is not really saying you can get milligrams per ml. Multiply by 10. 10. 10 milligrams per ml. 1% propofol. 10 milligrams per ml. 0.5% pubivacate, 5 milligrams per ml. Really easy. There is, there is math behind that. What's that? You think it'd be 1,000%. Well, yeah, don't, you got to remember also the percent versus the ratio. You always have to calculate that. In. I'm not going to get into it. It's been like four years since I've done the math to prove it. I couldn't do it right now off the top of my head. Because it's a But do remember, when you talk about percent, percent, like 1% is 0 0.01. Remember that in your yeah. statistics class? Yeah. Two? Okay, so. One or two. Statistics class. Thank God it's over. Now I get to do much easier things like I'm thinking distribution. So anyways, all right, so there was that piece of it. And then this other piece, this, oh yeah, I mentioned equivalents or milligrams, I mentioned percentage, um, milligrams, all this stuff. What about this one in 1,000 thing? One in 10,000, one in 100,000, one in, you know, as a matter of fact, I did see that when I used that Bristogena epinephrine and said one in 10,000. What does that even mean? And why do they do that? I don't know why they do that. But how do I convert that to something? like? If I've got epinephrine, it says one in 10,000, and I want to give a, a milligram of epinephrine for an ACLS code, how many cc's do I give? See, I already said a cc. <laughs> You'll see what I do. By the end of this lecture, the whiteboard's over here, right? So here's the red marker, here's the blue marker, and here's the black marker. And sometimes my laser pointer ends up over in a corner. I'm so bad about that. Anyways, so if you take a thousand and divide it by, oh shoot, I should have practiced this before class today. That it gives you mics per ml. This is there's a lot of ways to do it. This is how I do it. All right. I always put the thousand, a thousand, no matter, as long as the first is one in, 
which it always is. All right, now if you say two in, you can't do that, right? But if it says one in, I always take the number 1,000, and then I put the other number in the denominator, all right? And I get mics per ml. So, and if you don't know how to cross out zeros, oh, that like makes life so easy. So, anyways, <coughs> like my kids, they don't know how to do that. They're like teenagers, and they never learn how to cross zeros. Uh, gosh, I mean, I guess it's the age of calculators. But even that, it takes more time. Okay, so one divided by 10 is equal to 0.1. And I said, sorry, this would be then milligrams per ml. See, I have to, I have to think it through. No, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, see, I told you I should have practiced this. this is, I know when I do this, I end up with point, or I end up with five, right? So how do I do this now? Shoot, I should have practiced this ahead of time. One divided by 200 is equal to what? So I do that, one divided by 200 is what? 0. 0. 0.005. 0.005? Yeah. Which is milligrams per ml. So you end up with milligrams per ml. That's what you end up with, because it's actually five mics per ml. So this is what you end up with. If you do this, you, you'll get milligrams per ml, so in this case, it's 0.1 milligrams per ml, which is how many mics per ml? 100. 100 mics per ml. So if you're going to give an ACLS dose of epinephrine in this concentration, how many mls are you going to give? Patients in pulses v VFib, you're going to give one milligram of epinephrine, right? It's 100 mics per ml, how many mls are you gonna give? 10, right? 10 mls. Anybody know the Bristol Jet? Like how many mls is in a Bristol Jet? It's 10. 10. So the one in 10,000 is 100 mics per ml. See, I knew the final answer, I just had to figure out how I got there. Because it's not often I have to do this math. So, if you take, so whatever it is, one in whatever, let's say one in 100,000, what you do is you take a thousand, it's always a thousand, divide it by this number here. And that gives you milligrams per ml. And in this case, it'd be what? Point zero 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 point zero one. Hold on. One by by Point zero one. Right? So, which is 10 mics per ml. Now, I'm also going to give you a real easy thing because, by and large, with exception of like an ampule of epinephrine, which will be 1 1,000, you'll see that. That's a milligram also. All right? With exception of that, almost the only time you'll ever deal with this what in what. Thing this one in a hundred thousand and one in two hundred thousand is local anesthetics and the additional epinephrine to local anesthetics. Most often, most often you're going to see one in two hundred thousand. So anytime you see one in two hundred thousand, just remember this number. Buy my friend off. If the solution is one in two hundred thousand, it's five mics per ml. You need to be able to do the calculation because you might be asked, well, I don't want one in 200,000, I want one in 400,000. Now, one in 400,000 will actually be more dilute. If you do the math out, you'll figure out it's 2.5 times per ml. It's half as concentrated. Good thing to remember. Now, what you have to then be able to do is answer questions like this. You've got this local anesthetic, you got 50 mLs of lidocaine, 1%, that should automatically tell you 10 milligrams per ml. Boom, right? With epinephrine, one in 200,000 solution, that means there's five mics of epinephrine per ml. So 10 milligrams of lidocaine, five mics of epinephrine in every ml of this solution, right? How much lidocaine is contained per ml? 10 milligrams, right? I just said that. How much epinephrine is contained per ml? This is question three. 
by mice. Right. So, yeah. All right. Back to question two. How much lidocaine is contained per, contained per vial? And so then times 10 is 50 times 10. It's 10 milligrams per cc, ml. You have 50 of them, it's 500. All right? How much epinephrine is contained per vial? Five mics per cc times 50, 250 mics. Okay? It's awesome. 50 cc lidocaine, 2%. With epinephrine, 1 in 400,000. How much lidocaine contained per ml? 20 milligrams. How much lidocaine contained per vial? 20 times 50. 1,000 milligrams. 1 gram, right? How much epinephrine per, per ml? So you'd have to do the math, or you, or it's nice and easy where I doubled it, right? Now if I do one in 300,000, now you're going to have to do some math, right? Might do that to you, maybe. But anyways, I should have practiced that before doing it today. Sorry about that. Anyways, um, that is how it's done. One way, there's a couple ways you can do it. That's how I do it. Um, but anyways, in this case, it's 2.5 mics per ml. One of the things I suggest you, especially on the test, is when you get your answer, when you look at your answer, ask yourself if it makes sense. Like if I tell you one in 100,000, is that more concentrated or less concentrated than one in 200,000? More. So if you came up with 2.5 mics per ml, does that make sense? When you know one in 200,000 is five, it does not. Because you just gave me a more dilute answer. Right, so ask yourself, does the answer make sense? You know, think of it like that way, because you know, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't, I don't play games with exams. I don't try to, like, throw you off the word or something like that. That's not the way I do. But when it comes to the math stuff, I will go in and I will make all the calculation errors you can make. And that will be A, C, and D when the answer is B. Okay? I'll say, well, what's the most probable mistakes they'll make? This one? Well, I'll make sure that's one of the answers. Okay? So ask yourself if the answer makes sense. Just because you get an answer that matches doesn't mean it's the answer, right? Ask yourself if it makes sense. All right. Like, for example, I might, in a question like this, the lidocaine contained for CC, I might have an answer of 1,000. I didn't ask for vial. I asked for CC. See what I mean? Yeah. So. And how much epinephrine contained for a vial? <laughs> It'd be 2.5 times 50, which I think is 125 minus. Really? So, all right. Okay, okay. okay. y'all's lunch. Look, let's say 50 cc, 1.5 percent. Mepivacaine, how many milligrams per cc of mepivacaine? 15. How many? 15. Right? Multiply by 10. All right. Epinephrine, 1 in 100,000 solution. That's 10 mics per ml. You can do the rest. One other little thing. What if I wanted you to mix it? What if I gave you a little ampule of 1 in 1,000 epinephrine? Or I gave you a 1 in 10,000 epinephrine? And I said, all right, I want 100 mLs of 1% lidocaine with 1 in 200,000 epinephrine. You add the epi. You've got to be able to do that. All right? I just gave you a test question. Right there. Questions? All right. <laughs> All right. Y'all have like 40 minutes. Sorry. <laughs>